All right. Well, let's get started. I think we've got um, almost full capacity now. We've got 93. We only have 100 spots open. So I think we're going to get started here. I'm going to share my screen. So uh, let me know if you guys cannot see it. And I'm going to share right now. All right. How, how's it look? Is uh, everyone able to see my screen? Yep. Nice and clear. All right. And, and David, if you wouldn't mind, since I'm sharing my screen, just mm -hmm. give me a heads up because I can't see the comments right now. Okay. Well, I got the comments up and uh, I'm taking a look at the Q&A in case anybody Sweet. posts a question. Sweet. So. Okay. Well, um, hey, everybody. Welcome to this. Um, this is our first Learning Lab of 2019. It's a brand new thing that we're doing. Um, David and I are really excited about this. Uh, the first one, how to learn R fast. Um, this is your 30 minute playbook for success. I'm Matt Dancho. I'm joined with me by David Curry. Uh, we'll introduce ourselves in a minute, but this is a business science learning lab. We're going to be doing these probably once every couple of weeks. And um, it's really all about you. Uh, we want to be able to give back to the community. It's a big initiative that we're starting and, uh, and we're, we're just excited about it. So, yep. Okay. Um, so how the structure is going to be, we're going to try and jam pack as much content in it into 30 minutes. So uh, probably at the end of it, we'll, we'll reserve like 15 minutes or so for Q and A. And that way, um, if people have to get out of here a little bit early, they can still see all the content. And then, um, but for those who have questions, we're still able to kind of help you guys out and, and use it as a way to communicate back and forth. Um, again, my name is Matt Dancho. Um, I know a lot of you already know me, but for those who don't, I am the founder of Business Science. Um, I'm also big into education. So um, I'm a data science instructor at Business Science University. And, uh, and yeah, that's, that's a little bit about myself. How about you, David? Um, so my name is David Curry. Uh, I'm the founder of Shore Optimize, which is a digital marketing company. Um, Matt and I actually met, I took um, one of Business Science University's courses and um, we kind of interacted throughout the course and, and everything kicked off well. And I'm really excited about this because I had a lot of fun taking this course. Um, I love R and I, I'm really happy that I'm able to now utilize a lot of the things that I learned within my um, consulting company. So. It's just exciting all around. It's, it's great technology and great space to be in. So, yeah. so, so don't let him kid you. He was one of my top students. Uh, <laughs> and he, he, he owns his own company. He does um, marketing. And, he's, and he actually works with uh, business science. So, so yeah, he applies data science to, to his domain. He's also big into machine learning. Uh, I believe you're getting your master's now in machine learning. Yeah, thanks for that, Matt. Yeah, definitely pursuing that in um, artificial intelligence. And I want to help um, help our policymakers make better decisions with technology. So that's um, one of my long-term goals. Right. But let's, let's kick it in gear. All right. All right. So uh, here's the agenda for today, guys. Um, I made some last minute tweaks. So what we're going to be talking about first, we're going to go through a shiny web app. What I want to do is I want to show you the end goal first that we all want to get to as data scientists. And then what I'm going to do is step down through the process. First talking about the data science workflow, focusing on where R fits in. Then I'm also gonna talk about what we know about learning R. So we've done a lot of data analysis. We've uh, pulled together a lot of information. We wanna present that and then from there, develop some strategies that you can actually implement into your own learning to get you up and running as quickly as possible. Uh, and then finally, we're gonna end with a playbook for success. So the shiny web app that I wanna show you guys today is this thing right here. Um, so this is actually a web app that we're developing for one of our courses right now. But the, the whole premise around a web app is it allows business people to interact with data science. And you can actually build this with R, the programming language. It's uh, using a software called Shiny, which we'll talk about more in a minute. But basically, the, the cool thing is, is that, you know, as a non-technical person, as a business leader that has to make a lot of decisions, they want to be able to use data and machine learning, but they don't want to have to know all the ins and outs about the programming. That's, that's your job. So uh, what this app does that we would build is to be able to help them make better decisions. 
So this particular app is for HR analytics. It's an employee attrition prediction application. And you can see here that we've got different employees. So you can actually select, you know, different employees and it'll update. And um, it actually gives them a prediction risk. Um, so for a manager that's managing employees that does not want to see their employees leave, this would be really cool because it tells them not only which employees are at risk of leaving, but also the features that contribute to those employees. So if you think about it, this is all data science running under the hood. This is all R. Mm -hmm. This is H2O, um, which is a, a special, is a high performance pro, um, a high performance machine learning library in R. Uh, it's got Lime, which is giving us these feature contributions. Uh, it's got an interactive app, so they can actually like click on stuff, and they can really see, you know, what's going on with these employees. And um, so, for example, this first employee, uh, they have a stock option level equal to zero. So, if we wanted to retain them, we might want to try and give them some stock options. So, that's the type of uh, insights they can get very quickly from an app like this. Um, so, so yeah, this is the end goal. Hopefully, that makes a lot of sense to you. I know it's something that's um, very in high demand right now. I'm doing workshops on it right now with my clients. Um, they all want to learn Shiny. You know, you know the, one, the other good thing about this, um, I just want to jump in real quick, Matt, yeah. is that um, what we're talking about in this particular context, we're, we're focusing on data science for business. And within a business context, you, all, you have to think about how are you going to communicate your results to uh, the decision makers. What kind of information do they need to see? Um, what's the value of your work? Um, what's the return on investment and all that? That's why um, it's really important to put emphasis on you do all your work, you, you analyze data, you build models and everything, but at the end of it, um, what difference does it make and how is it going to be communicated to decision makers? And that's what the, the Shiny app's all about. Yeah, exactly. So you aren't actually helping your company until you help them make better decisions. And that's what this application is designed to do. So that, that's, um, yeah, I, I really appreciate you bringing up that point, David. Sure. All right. So that was the web app. Um, hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Um, now what I want to do is just talk about the data science workflow. So what ends up happening is you've got to start and you've got to finish. And at the beginning, you have a business problem. You've got something that your company has maybe asked you to analyze. Um, it could be something like customer churn. Um, maybe you've got employees or maybe you have um, customers that are frequently leaving uh, and not buying more of, or of the company's products. So at the end of it, you want to generate business value. And it's that process from going from the problem to generating value that the data scientist has to go through a strategic step-by-step um, workflow. So what I want to do is show you um, where R fits in. So we, we've got this first step, which is preparation. And that's where you're acquiring data. And you're also doing a lot of formatting and cleaning. And David, I, I don't know about you, but when I'm doing data science, I'm probably spending a significant amount of time in this area right here. Where yeah, we're like, like 70 to 80% of the time is right there. It's a lot. Right. So, so you really want to get good at the tools that are going to help you out in this area. Um, and you're really not able to move into the, the fun stuff, which is the experimentation, the exploration, and actually the modeling until you get good at this piece. Yeah. So, so then once you get into, or once you get the data formatted properly, you're then able to develop your hypotheses. Uh, you're able to begin uh, your exploratory analysis, which is transforming the data and getting it ready for visualization, then actually visualizing things and uh, developing models from what you're seeing in the data. So uh, the thing I do want to mention is that this is an iterative process. Mm -hmm. so, so you've got to um, understand that you're going to get to this model and sometimes you're not going to have, you know, results that really mean much. Uh, and you're going to have to either go back and reformulate your hypotheses and really focus on understanding the business and trying to collect data that uh, makes more sense to investigate that particular problem. So you really need to be very good at, especially this beginning piece, because you're going to find yourself get to here and you're going to have to go back to square one again. So yeah. that iterative process is, is very common. 
Yeah, that was, so for all the beginners out there, that's one thing that I didn't realize when first starting. I thought, so if we look at the Explore Art alternatives, when it, ca when it came to modeling, I was under the impression that, you know, you, you do some sort of visualization and things pop out and then you build your model. I, I wasn't even aware of the whole hypothesis, <laughs> hypothesis section. And it's, you know, it's almost like you're a bit of a scientist. You're coming in, um, you have an idea about the data um, and you hypothesize, like, what do you think um, is making a difference in whatever problem you're trying to solve? And you either, um, you know, you prove that to be true or false, and then you kind of keep going, you know, around till you get a good, um, a good definition of of the problem to start building your model. So, right, this this whole thing is really important. This whole framework because it gives you the complete picture from the start to the end, the business problem all the way to bringing value to the business. So it's really key. Exactly, exactly, and. The funny thing is, is like everyone always talks about going into production and, and trying to, you know, get that business value, but you're spending so much time in this section that that's really where you want to focus your learning and you want to focus on the tools that fit into especially this piece here and then secondarily this piece here. Once you get into the, this part, so you've got a good model, you're able to, to develop a report uh, and convince stakeholders that you're onto something. Uh, in your business leadership, and then you develop an app, that's then when you can get that business value because you can start to change those, you know, you can actually affect the decision-making within your company. Mm -hmm. so, so where does R fit in? That's, that's kind of the big question that I'm, I'm wondering um, right now. So let, let's talk a little bit about that. So R has this amazing tool chain, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, but there's this thing called the Tidyverse, which contains um, a bunch of these packages here that kind of get grouped into the, this thing called the Tidyverse. And then there's also the modeling packages, which are shown over here, like H2O, uh, Tidy Models, which is something that RStudio is actually developing right now. Um, and kind of the leader there is the Parsnip package uh, and recipes. So these collectively is what I'm calling the R tool chain. And it really provides a comprehensive set of tools that enables us to go from beginning to end. So, so here's how it fits in. In the first piece, you've got uh, some packages like Redar for reading in data. You've got some packages like Dplyr and Tidier for, for formatting and cleaning. So when you're deciding what to focus your time on, these are the packages that you want to focus on if you're trying to up your, up your game in preparation meaning actually preparing that data and connecting to data and, and getting it in the, to the right format so you'll be able to then move into experimentation. The next piece is once you get into that experimentation, these are the packages that you want to then focus on. So you develop some hypothesis, you then want to be able to transform and visualize the data. Dplyr and ggplot2 are going to be your best friend. Uh, so you need to um, be well-versed in those two packages if you want to be able to do this piece. And that piece is very important because then it helps your modeling capability. Then once you get into that modeling, these are the packages you want to know. You want to know H2O. You want to know Tidy Models. Now, Tidy Models is still um, largely being developed by RStudio, but I can tell you this. It's coming, and it's coming soon. Um, RStudio conference is next week. I'm actually going to be speaking at it. And they're going to be rolling out a bunch of new stuff. Uh, I'm sure there'll be a lot of talk about the Parsnip package. Um, and then one package I want to show you down here, this is for iteration, like actually scaling up your analyses and doing multiple analyses is the per package. So you want to be able to get familiarized with that if you want to be able to do iteration. So these are the packages that you want to learn uh, if you want to get then into distribution, which is building the shiny apps, uh, building the reports, um, convincing stakeholders, pretty much all of the communication aspects. So you've got our markdown and you've got shiny. We, sh we saw a shiny app. Our, our markdown is kind of, um, it, it's basically for uh, building business reports. So you really want to get familiar with our markdown if you want to um, then be able to communicate the results that you put together. Okay, so that's where it fits in. Basically, what we've got is an amazing tool chain for end-to-end -to -end data science analysis. 
All right. So hopefully now that you understand uh, a little bit about R, let's transition into what we know about learning R. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I've been doing this a while. Um, I've been teaching a lot of workshops. I've been seeing kind of how people evolve as data scientists. And uh, what I can tell you is the ones that, that um, are the best data scientists, they're really good with the foundations. They're really good with manipulating data, visualizing data. Um, the machine learning is, I mean, they're also good with that. But what I've seen time and time again is that a lot of data scientists, in my opinion, jump into the machine learning way too early. And they don't, and, and what ends up happening is they neglect those skills on the foundational side of it. So what um, is a really good approach that, that we've seen is, um, it's kind of like climbing a hill. You start with your data cleaning and manipulation. So you focus on the packages that are well suited for that. Uh, Dplyr and Tidyvir for general data manipulation and then string R for working with text, Lubridate for working with time series, and forecasts for working with categorical data. Then you move into visualization. So that's like uh, ggplot2 is, is basically the, the main package that's out there for that. So that helps you really develop the skills that you're going to be able to use then to convince stakeholders of, you know, in your business report. Before you can build a business report, you gotta be able to, to actually create plots that are going to uh, be very persuasive. This is what ggplot allows you to do. Mm -hmm. Then you get into functional programming and modeling. So these are uh, per uh, for scaling up and broom for being able to work with your basic models. So this think of this as like a kind of beginner modeling. Then you get into advanced. So at that point, that's when it's good to jump into the sexy stuff, right? This is like the H2O, the Lime, the, you know, all the stuff that like we're really excited about, um, you know, Random Forest, GLMs, XG Boost, uh, Deep Learning, you know, you, you name it. That's when, this is where you're, you're, uh, you're now ready to begin learning that stuff. And then finally is the output. So you've got the shiny apps, which is the main piece, and then also the R Markdown reporting. So it's like climbing a hill uh, from, from our perspective, and we've seen it where if you kind of focus on the fundamentals first, and then you kind of make your, ways up, you make your way up into the machine learning, that's, that's when you, um, you really get to be a very powerful data scientist. Yeah, and especially just to piggyback on what you were saying, Matt, with the visualization, I mean, if you, if you don't put enough emphasis on that part um, and you jump right into modeling, you don't, you, you, you'll probably miss a lot of nuances in the data. Um, and, and when you do a lot of visualization and you get very comfortable with, um, with the data and patterns within the data, and those things help you further down the line in the, uh, in the workflow. So it's really important to, to put enough um, time and effort into that part. So that's why we, we emphasize it so much. Yeah, the, the biggest win that I've ever got as a data scientist is not the machine learning output, but developing the best visualizations that can convince stakeholders that I know what I'm talking about. And you do that, uh, like right down here, we've got a heat map. I'm gonna show you actually this heat map a little bit later, but this is basically what is going to help make your job either very easy or very difficult. So- hey, Matt, we, we got a couple of questions. I just wanna jump yeah, in. I know we're, yep. we're gonna be short on time here, but um, one question is, um, this one is from, sorry, I forget his name, but he mentioned um, that he's using uh, Excel and he wanted to, to know um, how to go from using Excel to R. So that, that's actually a really good question. Um, we're probably gonna be doing another learning lab on that exact topic, going from Excel to R. Um, what I can tell you is R is the right programming language because a lot of the functions that you do in Excel are very similar to what you use in R. So for example, uh, the summing and in, in the mean and, and those types of function, it's a functional programming language. So it's gonna, you're gonna feel very at, at home. Uh, things like VLOOKUP, that's very similar to a left join. So really, if you're coming from Excel, what I can say is the biggest tip 
is to try and figure out what you're trying to do in Excel and try to map it to uh, what what is um, the appropriate function in R to, to accomplish that particular action. And I can tell you this, don't worry about spending too much time on it because we're going to do it for you. We're going to be yeah. uh, hit, hitting Excel to R probably in the next learning lab. Okay, and then one more quick one before you move on. Um, the, uh, Rebecca was wondering why were these, with so many packages and libraries out there, why were these chosen um, for the workflow? So, so there's a couple of reasons, and, and that is an excellent question, Rebecca. So what I can tell you is that these are the tools that I use like 95% of the time for to cover the, it's, it's kind of like the 80-20 rule, and I'm jumping the gun here a little bit. But um, you know what? Actually, we'll pro we probably should hold off on that because uh, we're going to go into a little bit of that. You yeah. know why why these packages were were selected? But it, it's um, we we did some data analysis to arrive at this conclusion. Um, all right. So what I what I will tell you is this: it looks like a lot of packages. It looks like it's going to take forever to get to the top. It's not. The path to the top can be done very quickly. You don't have to spend years of your life. In fact, it shouldn't even take months. It, sh it should be very a easily able to be done in weeks. Yeah, you can. And I even, it, it took me, I mean, I probably started maybe a year ago when I first started getting into it. But then after really getting serious, it only took me maybe six months to really ramp up. To, to learn the language and learn the, the basic workflow and then start building on that. Exactly. So when you start out, it feels overwhelming because there's so much, especially when you're on Google and hear people talking about stuff. But if you just, if you concentrate on the, the foundation and the workflow, you know where things fit in sequence. So, um, and then as you learn that uh, and you, you, you add on more skills, then there's sort of like building blocks in different parts of the workflow. Um, but yeah, it doesn't take long. Yeah. I, I've seen it done as, as little as a couple of months. I mean, like I'm talking six weeks maybe for the beginning. And then once you get into more of the advanced stuff, tack on another 10 to 12 weeks on top of that. So you're, you're really not talking like years of your life. You're, you're talking months or weeks, weeks to months. Um, all right. So we talked a lot about now, okay, this is kind of the hill climb what are some strategies that we can do in order to accelerate that hill climb? Because that's really what you want to be thinking about. You don't, the, the last thing you want to do is waste time. Time is your most valuable resource. And if you're, if you think you have all of your life to learn, you know, this stuff, you know, that, that may be true, but I can tell you this, you're not going to start accelerating your career until you learn R. You're not going to start accelerating and actually um, generating business value. I can tell you this, once, once I learned R, I was promoted, uh, I think three times. Uh, I eventually, when I left the company that I was working at, I was ended up uh, the director of uh, product engineering and sales. So I was overseeing a team of, I think, um, uh, 20 or 30 people. And I started uh, not being, not overseeing anybody. The re I attribute a large part of my success was because I was able to use and leverage R to be able to uh, develop very good reports that really showed exactly what was going on in the data, and it allowed us to make a lot better decisions. Um, and eventually, that made it its way up to the CEO level. So the um, the thing that you want to think about here is how can you get from zero to ten as quickly as possible. Ten being you know you're an advanced data scientist, zero being you're just starting out. So the first strategy that we're going to talk about is the 80-20 rule. So we want to focus on learning the top 20% of the functions and packages first, because that's going to cover about 80% of what you're ever going to have to do. So what are those top 20%? Well, we did a lot of data analysis, and this goes back into Rebecca's question where she asked, you know, how these packages and tools were selected. It's because we did this analysis here. So about it, um, 10 months or so ago, I did an analysis where I analyzed a, um, a, a pretty well-known data scientist. His name's David Robinson. And he, he's the, um, he, at, at that point in time, I think he was at Stack Overflow, but now he's the chief data scientist at Data Camp. And he's got a blog called Variance Explained. And what I did was I web scraped his blog 
and I found out what functions he's using most frequently and what packages those functions come from. So um, if you guys want, you can check out the, the data. Uh, the link's right down here. I'm going to give you guys a copy of these slides so you can check it out. But um, basically, we, we did a, a hefty data analysis. What I found is that at the beginning, when uh, D. Rob, David Robinson, started blogging, he was only using about 37% of functions from the this thing called the Tidyverse. But by the end of when I did that analysis, he was using about 80% of his code was coming from the Tidyverse. So this is a, a master data scientist. He's um, a craftsman. I mean, this guy is really good. And this shows you exactly what he's using in his code. It's the Tidyverse. Um, the next thing that I wanted to know is what packages is he using? So that's the next thing I analyzed. Uh, some of his code is coming from BASAR. And what BASE is, is it's just the, uh, the functions and, and programming that comes from just vanilla R before you load in any, any libraries. So uh, he's using a lot of BASE. He's using a lot of the dplyr package. And he's using a lot of ggplot2. So uh, everything else is a small, small percentage. So what th this tells me is you want to be focusing on learning these three things, base, dplyr, and ggplot2. The next thing, so those are the packages. What functions from those packages is he using? So these are the things that actually do the work. So when you load in an R, some libraries, uh, you're then able to use all the packet, all the functions from those libraries. So these are the functions that he's using. The first one is um, anything in blue is from BaseR, anything in red is from ggplot2, and anything in green is from dplyr, and then anything else is a different color. So you can see there's one other um, uh, function that he's using, and these are just the top 20. So you can see he's primarily using dplyr and ggplot2, like AES, for example, that's a function from ggplot2 that is every plot that you make has to use the AES function. So this tells me, you know, one alarming thing that you really need to, to understand is you need to learn dplyr and ggplot2. These are pretty much every blog article that David Robbins is, is writing. He's using these packages. And this also goes back to the emphasis on um, the beginning of the workflow where you're cleaning and visualizing the data. These are the two packages you'd be using heavily yep. during that portion. Yeah, so dplyr is for data manipulation, ggplot2 is for visualization. And, um, and I'll tell you what, I ran the same code in, on, uh, on my own libraries and I got very similar results as to what David Robinson is using. You know, some, some things are different because he's got preferences for certain things, but by and large, the core pack, the core functions that he's using, I'm using the same ones, and I guarantee a lot of other people are using those as well. So Matt, just a heads up, we're right at 30 minutes. Um, I know we also wanna do some Q&A, so we can step through and. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna continue on, and we're gonna let it go as long as it takes, and if you have to drop out, so be it, but we're gonna record it anyways. Yeah, so, sounds good. so we'll just post it online afterwards if you have to drop out. So I want to do a quick demo and, and show you what I'm talking about. So we've got dplyr and ggplot2. I'm going to show you um, the code that creates this particular plot here. So uh, th this is the, um, the code. Uh, it's in, it actually comes from the course that I'm in the process of, that I just launched here recently. And what we're doing is we're um, working with some transactional data. So this is actually um, each transaction has an order date, order ID, and so on. It's actually um, bike sales data of all things. So uh, this is for a hypothetical bicycle manufacturer. And um, what they're doing is they're trying to analyze uh, customer preferences. So um, the the graph that I want to show you is this heat map here. I'm just going to click on that. This is all the code um, that creates this graph here. So we, we do a couple of things first. We manipulate the data. So we take our transactional data set, which is right here. And you can see it's got order date, order ID. The, this is the line on the order, the quantity, the price, the unit price, the total price, 
the mod, the bicycle model and the, and the categorical information about, you know, what family that model belongs to and uh, what frame material it is. And then the customer, which is the bike shop who, who purchased it and then their city and state. So the first thing that we have to do is run code that looks like this to manipulate it. So when I do that, I'm creating a new uh, data frame that is a manipulated version of the previous data. And what I did was I aggregated and uh, calculated the, the proportion that each of these customers are purchasing uh, by category one and category two, which are the, the bicycle uh, product categories. So what this is gonna tell us is how uh, much a proportion of their sales come from each of these different product categories. So first thing I wanna show you is in order to be able to come up with this, what I had to do was I had to do a select, a group by, a summarize, an ungroup, another group by, a mutate, an ungroup, a mutate, a mutate. If that sounds like a foreign language, don't worry about it. What I'm gonna tell you is, is each one of these functions comes from the dplyr package in mm -hmm. R. So this is um, telling you exactly what, what David Robinson is doing. When we're manipulating data, we're using dplyr. So that's a, definitely a package that you wanna learn. Next, when we go to visualize it, we go through this series of steps here. Uh, sorry, I lost my spot. So we're going to take and run this piece of code, control enter, send it to the screen. It builds this plot here. It's a heat map. And what this allows us to do is very clearly be able to see what the trends are in the, um, in, in the data. So these are each of the product categories. So cross country race is one of the product categories. Uh, this comes from the, this is the mountain bike family. Uh, and, and think of this like a subcategory within that mountain bike family, cross country, fat bike, over mountain. And then we've got uh, on the road end of it, we've got elite road, cyclocross, endurance road, triathlon. Anytime there's a dark um, spot in the heat map, that means that cut that particular customer is purchasing a lot within that, um, within that bike family. So this tells so, so think, so put yourself in the shoes of a non-technical person. This shows you exactly what you want to know. And it tells a story. It tells you exactly that this Indianapolis Velocipedes is buying a lot of road bikes. Um, they're buying 37% of elite road. Endurance road is 24%. Conversely, over in the mountain section, you know, the largest one is 11%. You've got a 10% and then it, each of these other categories is like 1%. So that customer has preferences to be able to uh, purchase those road bikes. So from a marketing department standpoint, they would love to have this data because this tells them, oh, hey, if I'm gonna send out an email about road bikes, I'm gonna focus on Indianapolis Velocipedes, uh, probably Seattle race equipment, you know, any company that has dark spots in here is what I'm gonna focus on. I'm not just gonna send out a random email to everyone. So that's the type of power that this has. And in order to be able to generate this plot, it's all ggplot. So it's ggplot here, geom tile is to create the heat map. That's, the, that's ggplot, geom text, facet wrap, scale fill gradient, labs, like all of these functions are ggplot functions. So that's, that's kind of basically validating what we got from the data. All right, so what we have talked about is what you need to learn. Now we wanna talk about how to speed up. So we're gonna speed you up by focusing on what's called cheat sheets, whoops. So we've just released this new cheat sheet and it's available to everyone. Um, if you wanna get this cheat sheet, here's how you do it. You go to the Business Science website You go to resources, and then you go to ultimate R cheat sheet, and then you just click download. Whoops. Just click download. That's gonna download the cheat sheet for you. We're gonna click up open. So here's, here's the contents of this cheat sheet. So when you're learning R, these are basically a different representation of what I showed you previously. These are all of the packages that you wanna learn. Um, 
And what you can do is you can accelerate your learning by learning the cheat sheets. So if I click this cheat, the CS next to ggplot2, say that's, that's one that I wanted to learn. I click this and then I click open. And now I've got the ggplot2 cheat sheet in front of me and I can, fo I can hone in on which specific functions that I need to learn. So the ggplot2 cheat sheet is great because it has almost everything that you're going to need to learn uh, all in one, one spot. It's two pages. It'll take you a little bit to go through it all, but I can guarantee if you figure out how to use all, all of these functions, you're going to be really powerful. So that's yeah. how you And plus, while you're learning, most of these are going to come up in your, in your learning path. So you'll be familiar with um, you know, a good third of this stuff already. It, it, again, it seems overwhelming just starting out, but it's, it's, you quickly get a grasp of it. Yep. Yeah. The, the biggest thing is, and we're going to talk about this next too. When, um, when you go to um, your learning path, so as you begin to learn, you're going to be applying this on projects. So that's the, that's actually the next thing that um, I recommend is if you want to accelerate your learning, do projects. Cause as, as David was saying on your learning path, the more that you can apply these in relevant, meaningful ways, like actually at your work with your own data or getting data very similar to what, like if you, if you aren't actually working right now, maybe you're a student in school, but you know you're gonna be eventually wanting to work in marketing, get some marketing data off of Kaggle, be able to try, try applying these, these functions and, um, and actually building things like see how far you can go. See if you can take it to actually getting up to the, you know, building a shiny app with it. Um, so that, that's the third strategy. So just a, re a quick recap. Three strategies that you guys can implement right now. Apply the 80-20 rule. Focus on what uh, data scientists out there are using right now. And I can tell you right now it's dplyr, ggplot2. I would start there with those. Um, the second one is use the ultimate R cheat sheet, go to the business science website. You can download it for free. Um, it's just under the resources tab. Third, do projects, find some projects that are relevant to your particular area of interest or your particular career and definitely do projects related to that, applying what you're learning. All right. So I know we're going a little bit late here on time. Uh, I just want to give you guys a quick playbook for success. So we've talked a lot about this kind of journey um, and showed you where, you know, as you grow in data science, what skill sets you need to learn. Um, I do want to let you guys know that business science has made this super easy for you guys to efficiently and quickly get up to speed. We've got several courses that are available if you're interested. Um, the first one I just released uh, at the beginning of the year. This is business analysis with R. These are actually what you will learn. So if you're interested in learning with that uh, data science cheat sheet, you're gonna learn these packages here. You're gonna learn visualization. You're gonna learn functional programming and you're even gonna learn business reporting. Um, so that's the first one. And you're gonna learn it by doing two projects. The first one is a customer segmentation project, which helps the marketing department analyze their customer base and uh, identify clusters within their uh, marketing group. The second one is a product pricing algorithm. So this is a regression analysis uh, where you'll actually um, apply a little bit of machine learning to uh, come up with a product pricing algorithm to help your, uh, your company's R&D department uh, uh, develop some new models and uh, figure out what price point to, to price them at. So that's the, the, the first one. Um, the second one, so once you get through that beginner stage, then you're ready for this. Um, this is the intermediate to advanced course. And what this is is data science for business with R. Um, we have hundreds of students in this course already. They love it. Um, it's all about advanced analysis. So we give you this uh, consulting framework and actually walk you through an end to end project where um, you're, you're uh, learning, utilizing an actual churn problem. It's employee attrition. So the, the app that we saw earlier, you, uh, you're actually doing the analysis for that app with this course. Uh, you learn advanced data wrangling, you learn advanced visualization, advanced fu functional programming, um, advanced data science with H2O, which is kind of the highlight of the course. So if you wanna learn H2O, 
this is the course for you. Um, you also, we also follow this consulting framework throughout the entire process. And it's something that many of my students are actually implementing in their companies right now, and they're getting awesome results with it. Yeah, this is the, this is the course that I started out with in the business science uh, problem framework is, to me, that kind of blew me away because it, it gave me the whole framework for um, how, to, how to solve problems using data science in a business environment because I wanted to use it for consulting. So for me, like this was, this was what I was looking for, but nobody really had. So it's great. And then the, um, I mean, I'm, I'm super pumped about, about all of Matt's stuff. I'm not, you know, I'm not uh, building the courses or anything, but I'm just, it's really exciting because it's the type of um, course structure that I was looking for. Like I wanted something that was project based I wanted to like learn really quick, but then kind of backpedal and get all the meat of it later. And that's kind of how his courses do. It gives you a project, you're, you're kind of thrown in there and then, and then it sort of um, slows down a bit and gives you more information as you go on. So it's, it's just a, it's a really good setup for those who are looking to learn machine learning uh, and data science, particularly in a business environment. Yeah. Th thanks for that, David. And, and basically just so you guys understand, this is, these are all tools that I've actually used out there in the real world. Um, I've done consulting projects and that's actually how I developed this framework here is because my first consulting projects did not go very well. Um, although I was using, you know, data science in my own company at the time, uh, that I was working for, uh, I was also taking on consulting projects and, you know, I've actually, um, I, before I had this framework and before I developed this framework, uh, it was just kind of like trying, you know, <laughs> it, there was just no, no plan of attack or no strategy. So this is really what enabled me to connect the data science with the business. And as soon as I implemented this um, framework after um, taking on a long, hard thought about like what I was doing and, and actually developing this framework as a result of that learning process, um, it was like overnight, uh, my client's satisfaction went through the roof and, uh, you know, they, they, it, it just ended up, um, and actually I was able to, to, <laughs> um, even charge more, uh, I, I was actually evil, even able to increase my rates, uh, as a consultant because people actually saw the process that I was going to go through and they understood, you know, why that data science project is going to take, you know, two months to complete and I can't do it in one week you know, because I have to, to go through all of these steps and, and you're involved too. You know, it's not just me. We're, we're we both have to uh, work together on this. So, so yeah, that, that's just a little bit about the courses that we have. Uh, we do have a shiny web app course that's coming soon. Um, that, that should be um, here uh, in probably Q1 of this year. And then uh, there's also a bundle. If you're interested in taking both the 101 and the 201, um, you can get, uh, you can save over $200 by taking, um, both or, or purchasing, uh, the entire art track. Okay. So just to recap, um, you know, I know we're going a little bit late here on time. Uh, we talked about the data science workflow. This is where the tools fit in. Um, use that to your advantage. Uh, R has a ton of capability. And if you learn these packages, you're going to be a really effective data scientist. Um, it can be a little intimidating at first, you know, it's kind of like climbing a hill, but it's definitely achievable and it can be done very fast. Uh, remember, time is of the essence. Uh, it's your most valuable resource. You're not going to accelerate your career until you start learning this information and applying it at work and, you're, and until your, your boss starts to see like what you're able to put together. So Matt, uh, we got a couple of questions if you want to, yeah. or you want to do the recap and then we can get to it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just yeah, I think we already hit this one home, applying the 80-20 rule, uh, the ultimate R cheat sheet, and then uh, do projects. That's going to be your strategies for success. And then um, if you're interested, we do have the, uh, the courses available to help you along. You're going to be able to accelerate even faster by taking these courses. Uh, and I guarantee that they will help you succeed. Um, I, designed it I designed them exactly what I was looking for back when I was doing data science. And uh, yeah, it took me a lot longer than it's going to take you. All right, so what's, so you what's can, the questions? You, you can imagine the, the most popular question of them all. I'll see if you can guess it. 
I mean, I, I still can't see the questions. Oh, uh, you can't. Can you can you guess what's the most popular question that everybody wants to know? I have no clue. I have no clue. Oh man, it's it's R versus Python. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, that's that's a that's an easy one. Yeah, so so there there's a few questions around this, but they all have the same flavor. It's it's that you have two languages. Python seems to be growing in in popularity. Um, which one is better to use when, why should I choose R, that kind yeah, of thing? Yeah, yeah, no, that very, like this is when you're first starting out. So before you can even start learning R, you have to decide to learn, you know, which programming language, whether it's R or Python. And my answer to this is, look, if you're coming from a business background, you're probably better off learning R. If you're coming from a computer science background where you're, um, where where you're you've been programming for a while, you're you're probably better off using Python. You're just going to feel more at home using that language. Here's why: R is a functional programming language. It's, it's very similar to Excel, which is a func which is actually a functional programming language as well. So you think about in Excel when you use the sum function and you wrap that around a, a series in your uh, Excel spreadsheet. That that's a function. You're applying a function. R is the same as that. So when you are working with data in R, you're using the sum function. So um, the same thing with mean and, and median and, and all these other functions in R. Now, conversely, in Python, when you're doing that, you're doing dot sum or dot mean, um, and you're actually modifying the object that you're uh, trying to manipulate. So it's, it's just a different rationale because it's a, Python is what's called an object-oriented programming language. And what that means is people who are uh, used to JavaScript, that are used to uh, Java, that are used to uh, pretty much any programming language that's out there, that's mainstream, those are all object-oriented programming languages. So that's why, like when you're coming from computer science, you should probably do Python. When you're coming from business, when you're working with Excel, it's just much easier to learn R. Um, here's, here's number two. Um, the second reason I like R, I am dangerously fast with R. In Python, I am probably the slowest Python coder uh, out there. And that's not because I don't use Python. It's because um, Python, it actually modifies, it's, it's, a, it's what's called mutable. It actually mm -hmm. modifies the objects. So then I have to go back through and run all my code all over again. Um, R is immutable. So it doesn't actually modify it. It, it uh, makes a copy first. And then it, it um, so it doesn't change the data, the underlying data. So I can continuously tweak what I'm doing. And when I run into errors, it takes me half a second to fix it in R. Whereas when I do, when I run into an error in Python, it takes me, you know, I have to rerun all of my code again. So yeah, I also want to piggyback on this because I have, um, so this is something that, that uh, really kind of gets under my skin because my background is in software engineering and like my whole career, there's always been language wars. Everybody wants to argue about which language is the best and which one to choose. And when I started out with um, data science, I talked to a machine learning expert and he told me, he said, just pick one and get really good at it. You can always learn the other one um, down the line. It doesn't matter. Just pick one and go. Because the more you, sit, the more you um, spend time trying to choose a language, you're kind of wasting time. You could just choose one and get started. So read about the pros and cons to each um, and your specific uh, goals and which one may be best and then go for it. Like don't look back and then learn the other one, you know, once you get comfortable with the initial. Yeah, that's, that's definitely, I know it's a hot topic out there. So I hope that helps you guys. Um, and, and also David, your background is actually software engineering too. Right. Yes. Yeah, it is. So the picking up languages for me is not difficult, but um, like I really like the flow of programming in R opposed to Python. I was already familiar with Python, but um, I chose R just because it felt comfortable. Also, I really like the, um, the IDE that, it, that it's uh, the R studio. Uh, so everything is all built into this one nice studio and you have everything. You load all your packages there. You, you, you do everything. It's just nice. So that's the reason I chose it. But again, you know, it's, you just got to make a decision and, and move, move on.
Yeah, and, and just because a lot of people are doing it, meaning Python, um, doesn't mean that it's the smartest choice for you. So I would say um, R in my mind, uh, so just so you guys understand, I'm, I'm out there teaching R every day. Uh, there's a lot of demand for it. Uh, I can tell you I'm in the process of converting teams from Excel to R right now. I'm doing a huge workshop in London at the end of this month. Um, what, what programming language are they learning? They're learning R. Uh, and it's a, it's a major, uh, company, uh, for, fortune 500 company. So they're, they're interested in it. So there's, there's, um, let me see how much time do we have? Not much. Um, let's do, I think some of these really kind of take us off topic. Um, so I think we should probably, guys, I know there's, there's some of you are eager to get these questions asked, but I think what we'll do is we'll make a list of them and then um, either answer them in the email that goes out with the recording link or we'll uh, actually make a uh, whole separate webinar on the topic. Yeah, and I, I just stopped my share so I can now see the questions too. Um, we can go maybe another couple of minutes if, if there's uh, anything that you see in there, David, that's, that's uh, you know, something that we can tackle. But, um, you know, Yeah, I, so one, one that's probably quick is um, difference between R versus MATLAB. Okay, so, so R and MATLAB. So MATLAB, the problem with MATLAB is it doesn't have nearly as many libraries as R. Uh, because MATLAB is a closed source programming language and R is open source. So, um, for example, Py Python and R, there's just uh, huge communities out there that are just constantly building and improving. MATLAB, you don't have that because MATLAB is kind of closed source. People have to pay just to have the rights to put it on their computer. And then um, to be able to build libraries for it just uh, because, because of that closed source nature. That's that's the biggest uh, downside with it. Otherwise, I mean, it's 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 um, you know a programming language uh, that's designed for statistics, and uh, and also it's very good for machine learning. It's just not open source. Okay, and then the next one is: um, uh, Are there any uh, tools for incorporating uh, unit testing in your in the R pipeline? Yeah, yeah, there are. Um, so R Studio has been developing. Here, here's another reason I like Py or I like R over Python is because they've got a company like R Studio out there that has a team of 70 plus developers, um, actual computer scientists that are building R code every day that is open source. So they have this thing called R Lib, R Lib, and they have all sorts of unit testing that they're you know they they have packages out there for that. Um, they have packages that like all sorts of infrastructure that they've just been building to make it a, a, a world-class uh, programming language. Uh, if, if you haven't noticed already, I'm a fan of that company or studio and um, I'll actually be speaking at their conference uh, next week. Okay. Last two questions. Um, do you plan on offering similar courses for Python? Yes. Yeah. So uh, we've enlisted the help of um, an expert programmer. You guys may know him. His name's Fabio Vasquez. He's helping us with uh, the 101 course right now, and then he's going to help us with the 201. So we're going to be doing uh, Python courses. Uh, it just takes a long time. Honestly, uh, he he is um, he he has told me that the code that I've developed in R it's much more code in Python. So it's it just takes longer to develop that course. And again, another reason, if you're interested in in Python, I understand. But if you're interested in R, that, those courses are available right now, and they're really good. And you might be shocked if um, you know that uh, you might end up loving R and, and actually uh, appreciate learning. Uh, la last thing too, um, eventually you're going to need to know both languages. So, yeah, and that that's that's the point that I'm trying to drive home. Most data scientists know both languages; they're really good at one and proficient with the other. So just get started. Yep. Yeah. And then the last one, uh, can you provide equivalent tools like Per and Broom and SAS and Python and other tools too? That's a little loaded. We might. Yeah. I, I don't know um, enough about SAS and, and uh, even Python. Um, I, I would say the, the scikit-learn in Python is, is pretty much equivalent of the, uh, 
the, the tidy models and, and those, those sorts of things. Uh, they also have H2O and Python um, that's available. So, yeah. All right, guys, I think that's it for the questions. I know there's some more that are actually in the chat section. What we're going to do is go back through these um, and we'll, again, we'll outline them. We'll answer any that we need to in the email that goes out with the recording link. Otherwise we will um, try to incorporate them in a future webinar, but yeah. And, th and that's the, that's the other thing I wanted to say is thank you guys for attending. Um, I hope you guys had a blast. This was really cool. And um, we're going to be doing more of these Excel to R. Um, that's going to be one that I'm, I'm going to be focusing on. Uh, and, and David's going to help me out with that. And, um, and, and some of the other questions, David and I will put our heads together and we'll, um, we want to make these things great for you. Yep. So thanks to everybody for watching. It's been a lot of fun. I hope you got value out of it. And yeah. this is, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh yeah. Yeah. One other thing. Um, so Kristen Kerr and, um, and Fabio both have a webinar tonight too. So if you yes. guys want to check that out, um, they've got a really cool guest. His name's Dip, Dip John. Um, he's an awesome data scientist. He works with Intel. Uh, he's going to be on that episode. So, um, so definitely hit that up too. It's uh, in a few hours. Yep. Sounds good. Thanks again, everybody. It's been fun. Thank you. Take care. See you guys.